welcome to a brand new talk show called Moving Forward. I'm your host, Jennifer Collins. These are my friends, Emily and Christy. And we are going to demonstrate for you how that after you've been part of a high demand group, you can still move forward because life goes on and healing happens if you just keep moving forward. We found I have found that there's no no big trick to um, getting over maybe baggage that you have in the past or difficult times. Really, the key is just keep moving forward. You know, don't give up. Don't give in to um, the problems that come up or um, things that people may say to you. Just keep moving forward. And um, I want to just start off with introductions. So my name's Jennifer. Um, my husband's been doing podcasts for a long time. He makes it look like a lot of fun. So that's the reason I decided, well, I might try that myself. Um, I have three sons. Uh, they are 23, 19, and 14. Um, I spent a lot of time homeschooling them in the past. Um, and then we've done everything else from Catholic school, private school, cottage school, public school, uh, and all of it has worked for our family. So I'm very much not an in the box type of person. I um, can see value to a lot of different ways of approaching education for sure. And when I was growing up, I was went to an Amish school because that was the way that my family decided. They wanted to um, bring me up in the strict religion that I was being taught. Um, my father said that it was more important to him that I have peer pressure uh, not about television, but if I had peer pressure to wear a prayer cap, that was not a big deal. He could get around that. So that was that was how one of the ways that he made his decision to send me to an Amish school. <clears throat> so um, I was part of the Branham movement for a lot of years. I was um, it was 2011, so I was almost 41 before I realized there was any problem with it. But anyway, that's just enough about me. And I want to go ahead and let Emily and Christy tell a little bit about themselves. So my name's Emily. Um, I actually, I was when you said you've been out uh, when you're 41, I'm 42, almost 43. So that kind of puts your timeline in perspective. And my timeline, I've been out just about now as long as I was in because I um, left the message in... 2001. So I was 20 years old when I left. So um, born and raised here in the Midwest, um, grew up on the family's dairy farm, thought life was normal, was homeschooled, loved to run around outside, um, you know, enjoyed my life, had the small group of friends at church and thought that was was normal. Um, then I left when I was 20 and then started attending a local church when I was 21 and kind of kept moving forward and growing. And part of that journey ended up taking me over to Africa for five and a half years, living and teaching over there, worked with some semi-nomadic cattle keepers for 18 months, and then actually taught at a university. So here I was a grew up sheltered homeschooled kid who ended up teaching <laughs> veterinary students at the only vet school within a country in East Africa. So that's kind of my journey now back to the Midwest. And I am engaged to be married in uh, September. So that's exciting. And met a guy who grew up in a different um high demand group so our second date was actually spent telling stories of like yeah well i remember this and well oh really well i had this happen or I, when I, he says when i was in college they used to call all us guys out in the middle of the night and line us up against the wall and measure our hair to make sure our hair wasn't too long so <laughs> It's nice to have someone that has some shared uh, experiences there. So when I am triggered and have my moments um, of something from the past being triggered, he's very gracious with me. So that's good. So I'm excited to be here and just lend my voice to the fact that we're all just normal people. And it's not it's scary, but it's not that scary um, stepping out into your own and growing and being who you're meant to be. That's great, Emily. Thanks for sharing. Christy, how about you take your turn to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, my name's Christy. I am 35 years old. And unlike the other two ladies here, I was not raised in the in the high demand group that we were a part of. 
Um, I came into it when I met my future husband as a teenager. Um, we were high school sweethearts and he was born and raised in uh, message, the teachings of William Branham. And um, I was skeptical. I was raised in the Methodist church. Um, my family was on the far end of the conservative side of what you could potentially be as a Methodist. Um, so it wasn't completely out of this, the realm of where I had been taught to um, to add a little bit extra modesty, to add a little bit extra uh, submissiveness for, for ladies. Um, so all of that was just like a little bit more than what I had been taught. And um, so it wasn't a huge leap to join the message. Um, it obviously has some very, very different things between um, mainstream doctrine and a high demand uh, group like the message. Um, but yeah, that's how I ended up there. I, I uh, started going to church when I was 17 with my future husband. We got married um, three years later. Uh, I was 20 when we got married. And then um, we stayed in the message until after our second child was born. So I was 25, 26. Um, and we've been out for about 10 years now. Um, we moved cross country when we first got married, we moved cross country again, um, about six, seven years ago. Um, now we're in central Florida and we just love life. We have, uh, Disney world annual passes and we go all the time. Um, I just really love spending time with my kids. I have the great pleasure of being a stay at home mom right now. Um, so that's awesome. I have three kids at the moment, a 12 year old girl, um, an 11 and three year old boy. And I have one on the way be here in July and it's another boy. So my girl's forever the princess of the family because this is it after this. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about me. I'm also in graduate school. So I like to stay busy. Wow. <laughs> Grad school <laughs> and three small children and one on the way. Wow. My hat's <laughs> off to you, Christy. Thank you so much for sharing. So uh, the second thing I had on the agenda was personal and family updates. And we've done a little bit of that already. Um, but I did want to kind of just tell everybody sort of where I have landed. And um, also, I think it's important to note that lots of people land lots of different places, you know, and that's OK. Um, life's a journey. And um, I've one thing that I have learned is that people change. I think when I was in our high demand group, I kind of thought you kind of were what you were, you know, you could, you could get the Holy ghost, you know, and, but then from then on, you were just sort of the same person, but I, there's a lot of people changing and growing and learning. And that's, um, been really awesome to watch. So as far as, uh, my family, um, as I said, we have three sons. Um, we, so we have a son in college. We have a son who's an adult on his own. We have a son who's in high school. And for myself personally, this is my first year not being a homeschool mom, but I have stayed busy. You can imagine. Um, I was always, because I have I have my master's degree in education, and I had taught for three years as a special education professional before I ever had children. So I had sort of done that piece. I know for a lot of people um, coming out of a high demand group, they find themselves um, in the job market for the first time. That was never my experience. For one thing, I had to fund my way to college. Um, and that maybe makes me sort of an anomaly because I was encouraged and supported um, as a college student. So, I mean, I was expected to um, pay for my own way, but that's just the way it was in our family. It would have been no matter what religion we had. So um, I was able to accomplish all of that uh, while I was in the high demand group. Um, so as a homeschool mom, I drew on that quite a bit. And then that was also an avenue for me moving forward because I had the ability to be a teacher. So I, I taught in cottage schools, which you don't have to be, you don't have to have a degree to teach in cottage schools, but it sure helps you feel confident to do it. <laughs> and uh, so um, right now I am employed by our church, a Methodist church <laughs> as um, the director of children's ministry. So, and I also am a volunteer for the community Bible study locally that's the name of the organization, Community Bible Study. And that's a global organization. And so I'm the next gen director there. So I've got two director hats going on 
right now. <laughs> it keeps me very busy, but um, I wouldn't have it any other way. I'm the kind of person who thrives when I have a lot of irons in the fire. So uh, that's where I am personally. Um, and uh, I would, I know that Emily, you've already told us a lot of where you are personally, but if you have anything more that you'd like to throw in there, go, go ahead. Yeah, actually, so back in Wisconsin, uh, moved back within half mile, mile of where I grew up after going away 7,000 miles and really discovering who I am. And when I was overseas, came face to face with my CPTSD, which we'll get into probably later on in a future podcast. And uh Came back and working in the family insurance business. So that's kind of a juggling act. Was actually thinking about that the other day. A lot of my family is still in the message. My parents are still in the message. And I am the proverbial black sheep. And anything I say or do often has that tainted, oh, man, you know, she's just a troublemaker. I was thinking about someone in my family, and, oh, if they ha if she hadn't tainted them, you know, they'd probably be in the message and just kind of the thinking about the viewpoint of what it is being in versus being, quote, unquote, out or being on the other side and just the different perspective. And it's really freeing not to have that judgmental attitude. So the family business is insurance and uh, I enjoy doing what I'm doing. Very different from working uh, in veterinary medicine, um, but it's a lot easier on my back. And so far I've not had a client bite me. So that's a good thing. I do not miss that working with animals, but uh, to miss other bits still involved with Christian Veterinary Mission and actually going to be going down to Indiana in May. Um, to speak at a conference down there. So may have to cruise through Jeffersonville. We'll see where the airplane lands me. And uh, yeah, otherwise just enjoy doing life and uh, kind of sad it's a warm winter. Otherwise I'd be out ice fishing and doing that kind of stuff. But I really appreciated what you said about in the message, you think this is just kind of it and people don't change and just thinking about kind of my own evolution so to speak and you know overseas at the first uh church retreat sat down with some south african and british christians and had my first cigar and whiskey they're like hey come on over we're having a good evening and having fellowship you want to join us you ever want to try a cigar <laughs> so you know you're in you you think you're in this little box but it's the world is amazing god created so many different aspects of culture and uh, to step outside of that out of your black and white world is pretty amazing and i have a lot to learn yet my fiance is fully immersed in pop culture and he will say things and I'll be like what are you talking about he's like oh my goodness how do you not know that like well here i am <laughs> And so your fiance has done a good job of deprogramming from his high demand group if he's fully immersed in pop culture. Yeah, he, pop culture. He, I think we should probably have a pop culture pop culture moment, you know, in every episode, <laughs> maybe moving forward <laughs> once we've had a chance to repair. <laughs> he is fully immersed in pop culture and media because that's his job. He's actually in uh, the radio industry and is in media. So that's what he has to do is be immersed in it. <laughs> So Christy, you want to give us any personal yeah. and family updates? Sure. So um, when we left the message, we had two kids. We were in uh, Denver, Colorado. We were about, I don't know, 1,600, 2,000 miles away from our family that's in North Florida. And we just decided one day, like, I think it was, it had snowed that day and I had driven, I was um, teaching high school math at the time and I had driven to school and slid down into my parking spot and my car went up and over the top of like the, the parking bumper. And I had to have someone help me move my car off of that to get out of the, the parking lot that day. And I think we both sat down and were like, man, I really miss the sun. Like, I want to be back where it's warm. And that was the first move, the first kind of big family decision that we made that wasn't based on our proximity to a message church um, or wasn't based on our like doctrinal positions or anything like that. It was just a decision we made because it's what we wanted to do, which was really exciting. And we've been here since then and we love it. Um, 
We have three kids. My oldest is a theater kid. She's currently in community theater. It takes up so much of her time. Um, she does virtual school and she's just constantly busy. I love that she has the freedom to explore her interests. Um, my second child is special needs and he's in public school. Um, so we spend a lot of time trying to figure out what what to do best for him to help him reach his full potential. Um, it's really, really nice to be in a place where we have a lot of options for that. Um, he's been in private schools. I was able to homeschool him for a time and now he's in public school. And then my little one, he's three and just absolutely crazy. Um, so we're kind of in that phase of life where, you know, I'm trying to convince him that using the potty is actually cool and you can do it. Um, so yeah, that's like full on mom mode. Plus I'm expecting another one, um, because we're crazy and we just think we should add a little more crazy to our day. Um, so yeah, me and my husband, we love having, uh, our family. We love being able to raise them the way we want to. We love getting to really enjoy them. Um, when I, we were in the message, we felt very much like you did Jennifer and Emily, like we were who we were going to be. Like, this is like what we were going to do. This is who I was. Um, this was all of the accomplishments we were going to make. And we were just kind of like twiddling our thumbs, waiting for the end of the world to happen. You know, um, there wasn't anything else that was going to happen later. Um, so we're really excited. We have plans and goals and dreams and things for the future. Um, my goal, I want to get my master's degree in mathematics so I can teach at the college level instead of the high school level when I go back to work. Um, so that's a big goal for me. Um, so yeah, uh, my uh, youngest son, he is a choir person. He really mm -hmm. enjoys choir. So, um, I can, um, sympathize with you watching your oldest <laughs> with her, her drama. It's so nice yeah, that I... they can do the things they want to do, you know, without yeah. thinking about what they're going to wear or what music <laughs> is going to be involved. <laughs> Yeah. I, I love theater. So. I've actually gotten to be on stage since leaving the message again. I was something I did when I was a teenager, um, when I was growing up. And then when I joined the church, all of a sudden, like there was no way to, pro like I could do it. I think we did sound and music at one point when I was in college and I could do that because I was a nun and I was wearing a habit, right? Like there's not another part in that show that I could have reasonably played for costume purposes. Um, so yeah, I got to, I've gotten to be in several shows um, in the community theater. It's been really cool getting to perform with my daughter, um, something that wouldn't have even been possible in the message. So it's pretty cool. Yes, that is very cool. <clears throat> so I think our next segment was about leaving the message, maybe the hows or the whys, and um, just as <laughs> much as a person wanted to share or as little as a person wanted to share, that's fine. Um, for myself personally, and there's so many different there's so many different routes that people take when they leave the message. I think that there are people who leave and then they find out it's wrong. <laughs> there are people who find out it's wrong and then they leave. Um, and there's some people who sort of have a mixture in there. Like they leave and then they go back and then they find it's out it's wrong. So they leave again. Um, but I saw, I saw some conversation in one of our support groups that was talking about that, that, and that journey can be very different from one family to another. Uh, for me, I make a lot of people nervous when I say I really did not want to leave the message <laughs> when I found I out about it. <laughs> right. So I found out that, that it was wrong. And because of my relationship with Jesus Christ, I had no choice. I had to leave the message because I couldn't stay in something that was founded on lies. So that. That, like I say, that makes a lot of people nervous for a lot of different reasons. But anyway, that was that was my story. And um, I did have um, sort of emotional things going on at the same time. Um, we had family moving away. We had um, divorces in the family. Um, and all of those things sort of rock your world a little bit. And I think um, finding out that the message was wrong in the middle of all that somehow it made sense that it was wrong. You know, if everything is perfect, you don't really have a reason to question your belief system. But when things are messed up, that's when questions come to the forefront and you realize, you know what? 
this is not right. And I got to find out what is right. So that's just in a nutshell, sort of me leaving the message. I did not change my, um, I didn't change my wardrobe. I didn't change uh, what I did for the most part for like a whole year. I did do one thing. I put on um, sort of a modest swim attire and went to the Y because my back was killing me. And I got in the, in the warm water therapy pool at the Y. So that was sort of my first little quote, worldly unquote <laughs> uh, activity that I I chose to get into it and it worked. It worked. I mean, I, my back was not hurting within two weeks. So it was, it was definitely worth, worthwhile doing that. So that's so um, funny because anyway, that, 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 that was one of the first things I did too. When I, when I left was get a swimsuit and it was like the modest swimsuit, but I had never wanted to like mix bathe. And we lived in Colorado and that was like all that was available. Nobody has their own pools in Colorado. So yeah, I got a swimsuit and went swimming. That was like one of the first things I did. I remember um, the day that I decided I needed to go shopping for some clothing that was not approved by my high demand belief system. And that was, I was, I was in a local Taco Bell and I was sitting there with my sons and a, a grandmother and her granddaughter came in and the granddaughter was wearing a denim skirt and white Nikes. And I thought, oh, I feel so sorry for her being brought up like that. And I looked down, I had on a denim skirt and white Nikes. So <laughs> I thought, there's your sign. You need to go change your wardrobe. If you're going to feel sorry for other people wearing it, please stop wearing it. <laughs> and that was, that was my, that was my time. It was time for me to move on. So Emily, would you want to share anything about leaving the message? You did a little bit earlier, I think. Yeah. Leaving the message. Like I say, uh, it was all I knew. And there was a time period. Uh, so when I was 12, there was a worship pastor, I guess, uh, what do you call him in the message? Uh, song leader. There was a song leader at uh, the church that was my babysitter and inappropriate with me. And through that time period, now looking back, realized I went into kind of a depression there. And then my grandfather died a little bit later in my teen years. And that really rocked my world. And, you know, graduated high school and I had no idea who I was and what I wanted to be in life and seeing the arguments within the church of, you know, is anyone after the seal saved? Is anyone before? What's the timeline? You know, the pastor getting into this and I'm just watching this and listening to this and going, if there is a God, he is like the biggest jerk ever. And this is just ridiculous. And I hate this. And I'm just, it's, I'm being a hypocrite going to church and pretending all this when I'm not feeling it. And I have no idea what's going on. So kind of was a bum out of high school, I had some part-time jobs and my parents are kind of wondering what I was going to do with life. And I had no idea. Um, and then I'm just like, you know what, I want to stop going to church. I just, I can't do this anymore. Uh, it's frustrating. You go to special meetings and you see everybody running around and happy and, you know, dancing in the spirit. And you're just like, I want to feel that God give that to me and wasn't getting that. So stop going to church, thought that would make me happy. And it didn't. So I reached out to my grandma because um, there always seemed to be something different about her. And I'm like, Hey, grandma, can I go to church with you? And unbeknownst to me, she had been praying for years, found out later that the ladies at church were praying for years. Um, and because both her son and daughter and their spouses and all of us cousins, grandkids, we were all in the message. And uh, so she was thrilled, started going to church. And I'd hear the pastor preach something and one of two things. One, I was either like, how does he know this? I thought we were the only ones with this special revelation. Or two, he was preaching something and I'm like, oh my goodness, there it is, black and white in the Bible. That's not what I was taught. Oh my goodness, what, am I, what do I do with this? So, you know, just like this battle Sunday after Sunday. And then the doxology, they'd sing the doxology before the um, sermon and praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And I'm like, oh man, if there is a God, he's going to strike me dead for being here. <laughs> 
So I'd sit in the back in my denim skirt and hope nobody noticed me, you know, but I was, I was my grandma's granddaughter and everybody wanted to come say hi to me. And uh, then just slowly God started working in my heart. And then through that, um, had a chance to connect with a friend who knew my family from other aspects in the community. And then we started digging into, um, who William Branham was because she was curious because she knew my cousin and she wanted to know what went on and they called it the little pink church it wasn't pink but that was their derogatory name for us skirties um, I learned all the things that you know you walk into the grocery store and you're like oh everybody's looking at us it's because they know that we're so holy and you know they're getting convicted <laughs> they're looking at you going who are these weirdos we want to figure them out you know so then in that it was very 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 new. There wasn't all this research out there, you know, discovered that the cloud wasn't really the five, seven, however many angels he decided that telling of the story um, and what it really was. And and then the man from Windsor and different stories and and had my cognitive dissonance uh, kind of shattered and, and opened up through journeying with this friend. And uh then, yeah, April 3rd, 2002, I accepted Christ because the Jesus that I knew growing up in the message was not the biblical Jesus. The God I grew up with was, Jennifer says we have to keep this PG, so he was a jerk. <laughs> that's the God I knew, he was a jerk, <laughs> which I found out that's not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible is not a jerk. And uh, it was a relief the night I accepted Christ to share some of the dark things I had kept hidden in my life. Um, you know, even though you're an only child homeschooled growing up in a high demand group, you can still find ways to get in trouble. You can still find ways to be really, really messed up within yourself. And I swore to myself that I'd keep that hidden until the day I died and uh, shared that that night with the pastor and his wife. And she just looked at me and smiled and said, it's okay. Everybody goes through things and Jesus loves you anyway. And I was expecting, you know, sharing the deepest, darkest parts of me to be judged like to no end. And so that was just like really, really, that was so refreshing and so new that, yeah, the people are people and you can go through life and not be judged every moment of your day and have to put on a show and an act. Wow. I just got goosebumps listening to that story, Emily. <laughs> if I was, well, I'm going to go ahead and say it. I felt like the Holy Spirit was really happy with that story. That was pretty cool. <laughs> Chrissy, did you want to talk any about leaving the message and what that was like for you? Sure. Um, so uh, when I joined the message, I was 17. So I didn't know anything about it. Um, and when you first come in as a 17 year old, um, there's a lot of love bombs. There's a lot of like, um, you know, trying to include me in everything, being extremely understanding about my lack of understanding of the message and the rules and um, a lot of patience given uh, until you get engaged to a highly eligible young man who is the grandson of the pastor. And then it's much more judgmental and it kind of had a shift in tone and the expectation of me became way higher, um, almost uncomfortably high. Um, the judgments became higher. That was the first sort of straw, so to speak, um, is I noticed that shift that there was, that I was not included in the group. I was, I was tolerated as my husband's wife. Um, that bothered me. And that's part of the reason why we moved to cross country the first time was to go to a church where I, I could participate fully. I could have friends and I can be um, treated with respect and kindness as a message woman, because I saw myself as that. And that's what I wanted to be. Um, even as I stumbled through, you know, the, the learning curve that comes with joining a high demand group when you, when you weren't raised in it, so there's a lot of unspoken rules. There's rules that they tell, they tell you. And then there's rules that, that, that nobody says, um, that you're just supposed to know. And I didn't know them. So that was constantly causing problems. So we moved out there and we had, a, we started our family. 
Um, and then the next hurdle and straw that sort of got added to the pot was um, I had these two babies I'm trying to raise. I want to raise them right. And I don't know how to raise them right. It doesn't seem that there's one right way to do anything as a parent in the message. There's there's all kinds of flavors. Um, there's people that allow this and people that allow this. The church we left in Florida and the church we we ended up in in Colorado and all of the you know surrounding area churches did things a little bit differently and they allowed a little bit different things. And I had a really black and white way of seeing the world. Um, and I said, I want to know what's right. So me and my husband sat down and we started going through the message and going through the Bible because we're like, if we're going to do this and we're going to raise our kids and, you know, to follow the Lord, we're going to do it the right way. Like we're going to find the right way. We're going to do it that way. Um, so that was kind of the beginning of the end, um, because when you sit down and you start looking at things critically, the way we were looking at it to try and find an actual answer, all of the things that contradict sort of fall out into your lap and you can overlook a few of them. But when you get like 10 or 15 of these really important doctrines in front of you and they don't line up with scripture, um, you can find contradictory quotes. Um, then what do you do with that? So there was a straw that finally broke the back doctrinally. And we're like, what have we found? And this was before we'd even looked online because we, we were told not to go look up anything online. Like, don't go and find, you know, the Believe the Sign and Seek the Truth websites because those people, those people are just, you know, naysayers. They're unbelievers. Um, so don't, don't look at that. Um, so we were doing it ourselves and we, we thought we had found something that we needed to share, right? So we went to our pastor and we're like, we don't know what to do with this stuff. Have you ever seen this before? And they were like, of course, we've seen it before, Christy and Ben. You should just believe it. Like, you should just believe the prophet anyway. And we're like, which part? Like, what do we? So the contradictions are really what did it for us. Um, there was a day, um, I don't remember exactly what it was. We had brought all this to the church. And the pastor basically lambasted us from the pulpit. And me and my husband both looked at each other. And we're like, this is not right. Like, we were not doing anything wrong. And that day after church, we went and we looked online and we found the websites and we started seeing, you know, the prophecies that failed. And we had, we had gotten like little snippets of that previously when we had studied and you just like put it away um, and don't think about it too much. But it was like a dam breaking, like the last straw put on the pile and the whole thing crumbles. Um, so we never went back after that. We had no idea where we were going to go, but we knew we weren't going backwards. Um, so we skipped around. We visited a lot of churches and um, we settled on one. We attended for a few years and then me and my husband decided, you know what, we're really comfortable not knowing. Um, and at this season of our lives, we're kind of there. We're really comfortable not knowing. We're really comfortable not seeking an answer anymore and just accepting where we are in life and being comfortable in this place of saying like, you know, things are gonna happen. What, what we understand now is not what we're gonna understand tomorrow. Um, we don't have to have that black and white answer. And uh, that's kind of where we are. So we are not churchgoers. We're not raising our kids to be devoted churchgoers. And we're comfortable with that at the moment. Not to say we won't do it in the future, but right now that's where we are. And um, yeah, leaving the message was hard. <laughs> we didn't want to, just like you said, Jennifer, we didn't want to. Um, but yeah, once once we had started questioning things, um, we were kind of shunned in like the worst possible ways. Uh, we were terrible influences. Uh, we had people calling. There was uh, there was one brother who called my husband and asked, told him that he needed to leave me, <laughs> that I was the problem. Um, so that was horrible. I was accused of having a woman preacher spirit, which is like a really weird thing to be accused of when we're not allowed to be preachers. I'd never spoken publicly ever um, in a church setting. So I don't know. Yeah. So that's, that was my experience. Um, what's been cool though, is that since leaving a lot of those people that were really ugly to us when we left and we were like asking the questions they have since left. 
that's like kind of, I want to be, I want to be like, ha ha, you see, we were right. But I really don't feel that way. <laughs> I'm just so happy that there's more people that are escaping this high demand group and that, you know, generationally, this isn't going to continue to pass, you know, them. Well, thank you so much for sharing that journey, Chrissy. And uh, there were so many things in there that I could um, understand and know exactly where you're coming from. I think in our family, like everybody on my husband's side blamed me me for us leaving the message and everybody on my family side blamed my husband. So <laughs> there was plenty of blame to go around. And we were like, we did this together. <laughs> this is not something <laughs> one of us did and dragged the other one along. There was no trying to talk anyone into anything. Um, the message, unfortunately, or fortunately, I guess I'll say fortunately, uh, sort of just falls apart as soon as you poke at it just a little bit. There's just not, there's not much substance there. Thank goodness. So I think our final segment is supposed to be about an anecdote um, illustrating how far we have come. And uh, I, I went back and forth on what which, which anecdote am I going to share? And if we decide we want to share more than one, that's okay too. But I know that for myself, we, we went through quite a journey um, with church. Um, the first church we ended up in was a Southern Baptist church, and we decided that was not for us um, after probably three or four years. Um, and the, the one that we were in specifically, um, they were not real sure that mental health medication was a great idea. And, um, we found that to be very problematic. So that was one of our major, major problems with that particular church. And I'm not saying there's tons of Southern Baptists who think that's fine, but that was just one, our little thing with that little church. Um, and then we went to kind of a mega church. And I think a lot of people um, who leave high demand groups find themselves in mega churches because you can be blissfully anonymous. <laughs> you don't have to answer to anyone. You don't have to know anyone unless you really want to. Um, so that I think is pretty common to people who leave high demand groups. They find themselves going toward mega churches so that they can sort of blend in and they can kind of find out what mainstream Christianity is like without without having to kind of show everybody that they've been different in the past. And so that was an experience. And then we got to a place where one of my sons really enjoys um, smaller settings. He's not quite into the large group stuff. It's not that he has problems with it. It's just that he enjoys a smaller setting better. So he had started going to the local Methodist church to their youth group with a friend from a homeschool group. And so they had like a lock-in for the beginning of school, um, might've been even the end of school. And I decided, okay, I'm going to go visit this United Methodist church. And their website was so out of date that um, it said they had two services and they only had one service and we were going to go to the second service and the first service was over. <laughs> By the, my, my son's calling me, where are you, mom? I thought you were coming. So we went the next Sunday then. And I was all prepared for everybody to be wearing robes and, you know, there might be a woman preacher and all that stuff was going to freak me out big time because I was still, still pretty conservative. Um, but I showed up in um, the sweetest guy and he was just dressed like a normal person. The weirdest thing that happened was he raised up the offering um, that when you think about it, that that's kind of biblical, right? They raised up the sheaves, you know, as, as an offering to the Lord, you know, but at the time it felt liturgical to me. <laughs> so I was like, well, that's kind of weird, but that was sort of my only sticking point. And uh, so I ended up dun, 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 joining <laughs> Methodist church, um, became a church member. And uh, I remember the first time that they asked me to help serve communion. And um, so it's grape juice, not wine. And it's, um, Hawaiian bread. And so it's, we take it by intinction, which means we push the little bread together so that it doesn't take too much wine and we dip it in the wine. We take it like that. But I was asked to, I think I held the bread and I would tell the person people as they came by the body of Christ broken for you. And then the person next to me says, and the blood of Christ shed for you as they dip it into the grape juice. And, um, that was so completely different from anything I had ever visualized myself doing that I decided I would share that as we have come so far because 
that is just so far away from anything I thought I would ever do, but it was so meaningful to me when I came home because, um, you know, at the end of Matthew, when the disciples were commissioned with making disciples, that was all of the disciples. They were all the women and the men, they were commissioned with making disciples. And so for, for me, I felt like I had sort of come to myself as, as a believer, as part of the priesthood of believers. And that was, that, uh, that just, I just blew me away. And it still stands out in my mind as one of the most important moments of having left the message. So did you guys prepare an anecdote? <laughs> I did not prepare an anecdote. I glanced at my list and uh, this was, you know, life happens. I've been busy with work. So man, like which story do I pick? You know, I already talked about uh, smoking a cigar and drinking some whiskey or some, actually it was 18 year old or was it 15 year old, uh, single batch scotch for those who may know that's like you know not just your local bourbon down the street but that's some good stuff uh so i mean that's something i never imagined but um you know it's amazing the conversations and the fellowship that i've had over a cigar and uh some scotch or working now i work part-time at my church and i'm back in the av room and i run the projection up in front of this church that we have two big services a sunday and i'm the one that cues the videos and you know all this stuff that's oh man it's all this showmanship and these these mainstream churches are just about you know they're just a social gathering at a club but you know it's interesting being back and seeing how much a part of ministry that is and how that does draw people in and some people may be annoyed by it um, but that's okay because we're all create you know I, I, I think of a story um, you have two kids and one draws you a picture and one does dishes for you to show their love for you which one are you going to love more you know, they're both your kids. They're both showing you their love. So God has created us to show him love in so many different ways. And that's, um, you know, yeah, an anecdote. I mean, there's, there's that <laughs> thinking about when you're talking about swimsuits, the first, like I was wearing a one piece, very modest swimsuit, but I always had the shorts too. And so I was over in Africa with my ladies Bible study group and we went camping together and they convinced me at the pool to take off my shorts and they were super supportive and I felt super naked and it was so awkward. Here I am in my late thirties, you know, freaking out about taking my shorts off of my swimsuit, but you know, slowly now I don't think twice about it. So it's just, it's interesting each step of the way. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I don't have one. No, I have many. <laughs> And I'm sure they'll come out as the as the time progresses and as we continue to talk here moving forward. Yeah, I didn't have one anecdote either, Emily. I could because I was started like trying to figure out like what I would say. And I started going through like the clothes and the hair and like wearing makeup for the first time, like buying the swimsuit, like Jennifer said, like all those things are just like now being 10 years removed from it, they're like the smallest changes that have happened in my life. Um, the bigger changes have been like intangible things, like, like not feeling guilt or shame about a decision that I make, not, not constantly second guessing my clothing choices. Like you remember the message, like you would buy something and you, you try it on in the store and then you'd go to wear it that next Sunday morning. You'd be like, oh my gosh, why did I buy this? Is this okay? And you'd be like taking pictures and sending it to somebody to be like, can you see my underwear through this? Like you just second guess everything. And I don't do that at all. I don't do that at all. Sometimes I wear something and I come home and I'm like, man, I should not have worn this Christy. You look like a crazy person. Um, but there's no shame or anything about that. It's just like, well, this was a weird mom outfit day. Um, so that has been a huge difference. Um, I don't know if you guys have had that same experience where it's just not the tangible things. It's just like these things that normally your brain would go there and you just look up and you're like, wow, I'm not even worried about this right now. And the message would be such a big deal. 
For sure. I remember, and I think my husband has shared this um, story before, but I remember when we first looked around a restaurant and all the other families coming in from church and sitting down to have food. And we realized these are our brothers and sisters in Christ. It's like all of a sudden God's family just exponentially multiplied because we, you know, we only paid attention to people who had been, you know, who, who had the same dress code as we did. And if they were strangers, we were trying to figure out which other high demand group locally they belonged to. Cause there were two other high demand groups locally and we <laughs> did not fellowship with one another. So it was like, is that someone, is that someone who's visiting from out of town who, you know, or is that one of the other high demand groups, you know, and then there's the whole tapes versus preachers groups. And then within the preachers, there was the whole, there was the whole um, thunders versus bride coming versus whatever um, groups. And, and so, yeah, I think the realizing that the whole, you know, the whole restaurant was full of people and, and it, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm talking over top of myself, but it made me, when I went, I, I went back to when I was in college and there were tons and tons of other people in my classes who just were not good enough. Oh, I'm mm -hmm. wincing to be my friend, right? right? They, I was, I was looking for only people who believed exactly like me. And that, you know, I feel like that's, that. You know, Christy's talking about being a person who doesn't go to church. That's fine, right? And so now there are even more people. I mean, probably at that point in time, we were just thinking about the people coming in from church, right? But now there's you, there's the whole, you know, the whole block, the whole city, you know, everybody, everybody. And um, yeah, it's just, it's like you say, the, the, the small things become big things. And then the things that you thought were big are really not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Everything that I thought when I left the message, I'm like, oh my gosh, my kids are not going to live holy lives. Like they're going to wear pants and um, like my boys are going to like date and kiss girls before they get married. Like all that stuff just seems so superfluous to what my goals are for my children now, you know, um, it just seems so silly uh, moving away from it 10 years now. Um, I have much bigger goals about their character and about their, you know, achievements in school. And my son, my son, that special needs, like my goals for him are so big. I want him to have independence in adulthood. And, you know, I don't have the little silly concerns about dress code and, you know, is that song like the right kind of Christian song for my child to listen to. I don't care. Like it doesn't matter to me anymore. Um, so I think that that's a huge amount of peace that comes to your life when you're not having to overanalyze every single thing that you do and everybody around you is doing. Wow. That is such a big, important word, peace. Um, and that is no fear. I, that's the thing that I keep coming back to, you know, it's like, the fear is gone, right? The stuff, the stuff that used to scare me so badly, it's just not even scary <laughs> anymore at all. And uh, so I, and I think we've touched on a lot of different topics that we can come back to maybe and have a whole, a whole talk show about, like we could have a whole talk show about special needs um, and we could, you know, find someone else who's walked that path, you know, as a, a mother of a child who has special needs and talk about how, you know, that impacted them or how their life has changed um, having some, a child with special needs and it's not something that you're supposed to pray away or something exactly. that is, <laughs> yes. Or something that is a punishment yeah. for heaven's sake or something you have done, or maybe their grandparent did. Oh yeah. So there's a lot there. Um, but I love too, that we've sort of gotten to the place where we're saying, uh, talking about moving forward again, because life goes on. And healing happens. You know, we just keep moving forward. So did either of you have any special words you wanted to say before we close out our first talk show? 
when you're talking about special needs, just thinking, yeah, the whole praying away and thinking about the just emotional abuse for these poor. I just think of this one girl that had uh, physical um, needs and, you know, was just how she was but they always would come together and pray for her and oh man you know take the spirit off of her and this and that and you know i want to marry a guy who's on the autism spectrum and that's how he is and you know what i love him and obviously i'm going to marry him uh and he's not broken he's just who he is and for us to put all these labels on what are your expectations and what do you have to be you know he Oh man. Yeah, some days I'm I I feel <laughs> I'm like how do you how do you come hang out with me? I think my IQ is like very very low compared to you, you know. So <laughs> but he yeah, we just it's so frustrating people that are caught in this and they don't know they're caught in this and it's all it's all consuming for them and that's why i'm willing to put my voice and my face and my name out there and hopefully um you know I, my family may see this and it's not to bring a bad name to my family it's to bring freedom to others and i've had a chance to see just went a couple of weeks ago to a funeral of a dear lady uh, my my friend's mom who had been in the group for 41 years and started doing a bible study with her daughter and started her eyes opened up when she was in her 80s and then went to her funeral and the pastor had a great sermon you know he's got full sleeve tats and and gauges in his ears and uh had a great sermon for her and there are the message believers sitting off in the corner in their own row in the pews by themselves because well i don't know so if my voice can help bring that healing and moving forward to someone and just you know stop and go okay is this all i think it is or is there something more in life that's my hope for this yeah i agree i had the i have the same sort of sentiments i think the one thing i want to uh, do with this, my participation in it is to help people that are first leaving, especially um, to recognize that there is light at the end of the tunnel. Like right now you're looking at yourself and you're judging your decision. You're critiquing everything, every decision that you're making in terms of changes and all of that eventually will become completely um, superfluous to the person that you are. Um, those those little minor even superficial things are not what make you who you are and make you a value it's not what makes your children a value um it's not the thing that we should focus on in our relationships with other people um <clears throat> leaving and moving forward means seeing ourselves for who we are and embracing that fully seeing others for who they are and embracing them and being able to love them fully um and as a parent to see my children for the, the little, you know, humans that they're growing up to be and getting able be having the ability to really treat them as individuals, um, to let them explore their own interests, to help them reach their own full potential, all of those things, that unconditional love and support for them as people that, you know, I, I didn't have in the message. The, you know, high demand groups don't really want you to be an individual. You really become a caricature of where you are in life. You're a mother, you're a grandmother, you're, you know, a young lady looking for a spouse. Um, you're not a unique person. And as you move farther and farther away, all of those things that kind of put you in a box disappear and you get to just be yourself. Um, so I think that's what I hope everyone who, who sees this can see is that you know, you're going to be your unique self finally, um, the farther you move away from it. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Christy, for being with me. I think we have done a pretty good job of beginning to show everyone who's watching that we can move forward and life does go on. Healing does happen. We just keep moving forward, put one foot in front of the other and move ahead and you will be successful coming out of these high demand groups.